person. This is the first time we are in. stuck to our new parking lot. The, the apron just got poured on Friday, which is why the, that apron is roped off because it needs more time to cure before cars go over it. Next time you come, you'll be able to pull into Buena Vista and exit Navidad. Um, so we're, we're making progress. It it's just takes a while, so I apologize about all the, the dust. We do have um, a few things that will be coming here next time. Next time you're here, hopefully, we will not only have that parking lot done, hopefully next time we will also have a fence up. You probably saw that there are posts out there that they're, they're working on the fence. You also probably noticed all the dirt that's outside. So the next stage is also landscaping. And then, very importantly, after that, we'll be adding a wheelchair ramp. That's something we are missing right now. It has to be custom made for this older building. So it just takes a little while to get that designed and manufactured. Um, I mention all of this to you because I, I want you to understand that this has been a very long process to get us to here. And it's also been very expensive. Um, you know, we want this space to be very inviting to the community, but that does require a lot of work uh, on, on the outside to, to make it as welcoming as we want it to be. And um, we also, of course, want the things that we do here to be either free or very low cost. So many of us never got to learn this kind of history when we were um, in school, when, you know, um, maybe we didn't learn these things until we got to go to college and maybe have a professor like uh, Dr. San Miguel. Um, so we want these things to be accessible. So I bring all of this up because if you might want to make a donation to us, we have many ways for you to donate and support the kind of work we're doing. And again, hopefully next time you come, um, we'll have the landscaping in, we'll have every, you know, everything outside looking good for you so that when you come, it's a little bit easier to navigate the parking lot. Um, with us today, I am very excited. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Guadalupe San Miguel, longtime historian at the University of Houston. And, um, and the author has a number of scholarly books and articles. A lot of his work has focused on the history of equity and education, which is something very near and dear to Macri's mission. And um, just recently, he came out with a new book, In the Midst of Radicalism, Mexican-American Moderates During the Chicano Movement. And this book is something that I think is really going to connect to a lot of the um, experiences that people in San Antonio had during the, the Chicano movement. A lot of the folks that Dr. San Miguel writes about are people that have connections to San Antonio. Um, just here in this little neighborhood, we had a number of moderates very active during that time period. So we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Guadalupe San Miguel about well, what was going on with these folks who um, were in some cases cri really criticized during the Chicano movement for not being radical enough, for not being active enough, um, but perhaps they did find other ways to um, make uh, policy change. So thank you so much for coming all the way from Houston to be with us today, Dr. Guadalupe San Miguel. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, to present on, on my new book, uh, In the Midst of Radicalism. My, my book focuses on the Chicano movement in general and on the role that moderates played in it. In, in this talk, uh, I want to do three things. First, I want to talk about what inspired me to write this book. Second, I want to discuss the organization of the book uh, lastly, I want to 
end my talk by summarizing the importance of my book and how it revises our understanding of the Chicano movement of the past. First of all, I want to start off with a uh, personal incident, um, a very moving um, event that took place in my life that uh, encouraged me to look at the role that moderates were playing um, in the Chicano movement. Uh, in, in July uh, of 1971, I was arrested, uh, slightly beaten up by cops in jail. This took place in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was 21 years old. And this day, I was cruising the neighborhood with a few friends. We were members of Mayo, an activist group in, in, uh, in Texas. We approached the Carousel Club, a popular local dance hall in Corpus. We saw two cops harassing a local youth. One of the cops was an, was an Anglo, the other one a Mexican-American. As self-appointed guardians of, of the barrio, we stopped our car, got out, and approached the cops. We confronted the cops and asked them why they were questioning and harassing this Vato Loco. They looked at us and yelled, shut up and get back in your car. This is police business. We refused to obey them and continued to step forward with me in the lead. Without saying anything, they quickly ran towards us, caught me by surprise, threw me against the police car, handcuffed me, and aggressively pushed me into the back seat. They arrested me and took me to jail. The other guy was let go and not go. My Mayo friends quickly went back to the car and said that they would get someone to bail me out. On the way to jail, and while still handcuffed, I tried to reason with both cops and engage them in a discussion of police harassment. One of them kept yelling at me to shut up. I ignored him until he began to hit me on my head with his baton. I figured it was time for me to shut up. <laughs> the person who came to bail me out and later found out was Tony Bonilla. Let me see. The next slide, please. Okay. I think he's a, um, somewhere in the picture there. Um, he was a local LULAC member and prominent attorney and civil rights activist. Tony had several brothers and at least one sister. They were all attorneys. And for several decades, decades had been involved in community affairs and civil rights issues. Tony, as well as William, his older brother, and Ruben, his younger brother, were or became at one time presidents of the local and state chapters of LULAC and of the national organization. Despite this history of activism, Mayo members, especially me, did not trust Tony or any other Lulac member because in our view, he did not question the racist and corrupt system we lived in like we did. Also, Tony, we felt, did not believe in confrontation, in attacking gringos for their abuse of the Chicano, Chicana community, and in questioning the government's role in fomenting wars against those who fought American imperialism in Latin America or in Asia. Tony, in other words, was not one of us. He was, in our eyes, a vendido, a political moderate and an enemy of the radicals. Despite being someone we distrusted because of his political views, Tony quickly came to my assistance and bailed me out from jail. His support went beyond merely helping me get 
out of jail. During the next several years, he and additional LULAC members continued to support Mayo in general and me in particular in our struggle for social justice. Now I even got a scholarship from LULAC several years later to go to college. Um, I later found out that other so-called vendidos or political moderates like Dr. Hector P. Garcia also played a key role in aiding the struggles of radical youth such as myself and the Mayo organization. Dr. Garcia in the early 1970s, for instance, even supported the local Mayo takeover of the superintendent's office to protest the lack of integration in the public schools. He joined Mayo members in this takeover and even got arrested with them. These, as well as many other similar incidents of support by so-called vendidos, during the next several decades, made me question my negative view of moderates. By political moderates, this is slide. By political moderates, I mean those who believe in the system. Um, look towards the federal government to help solve the problems in the community, were respectful of government officials, sought to work within the system, and rejected the politics of protest. Many years later, and after working with many other moderate leaders in the Chicano movement, I came to two major conclusions. First, moderate activists, including those working in the field of education, had been instrumental in fighting against the pervasive forms of discrimination faced by the Mexican-American community for most of the 20th century. They, in other words, had a rich history of activism that we needed to acknowledge. Second, moderate activists continued to play an important role in the Chicano movement. The vast scholarship of this movement, next slide. I think we moved. Um, let's see, go back. No, okay, go forward. To, sorry. Okay. Let's see, try the next slide. No, okay, go back. Um, the best scholarship uh, of this movement, however, ignores or dismisses them and privileges only those who engage in the politics protest. Moderates, however, did not disappear or wither away during the years of radicalism. They remained and increased during their presence <coughs> during these years. Who were these individuals? What organizations did they form? What kinds of actions did they take? And how did they relate to the more radical members of the Chicano movement? While acknowledging their role in the Chicano movement, I also wanted to initiate a discussion of what moderation and radicalism meant in the struggle for social justice. How do we define moderates and radicals? And how does this help us better understand this movement? These types of events and concerns served as the inspiration and basis for this book. I wrote this book then for several reasons. First, I wanted to acknowledge the existence and important roles played by moderate activists in the Chicano movement. Not all of those involved in the movimiento were radicals. Not all the activists had lost their faith in the system, engaged in direct action tactics and civil disobedience, or called for significant transformation of American society. Many of them continued to believe in the established structures, ideals, and leaders of this period, especially of the role the federal government should play in resolving local, state, and national problems. And many of them embraced the politics of persuasion. These individuals retained their faith in the system and its leaders and sought to bring about important change through existing institutions and channels. Moderates were an integral part of the Chicano movement 
and deserve to be recognized as playing important roles with radicals. Next slide. Second, I also wanted to give educational activists their due. In most of the histories written about the Chicano movement, educational activists, that is, those individuals opposed to multiple forms of discrimination in education at all levels of government, and in support of culturally relevant reforms such as desegregation, bilingual education, and ethnic studies in the public schools are neglected, ignored, and dismissed. Parents such as Jose Cisneros who initiated the Cisneros desegregation case in Corpus Christi, government administrators like Dr. Bandi Cárdenas who challenged the dismantling of civil rights under the Reagan administration, community activists like Guadalupe Angiano who established the Office of Mexican American Education in Washington, D.C., teachers like Maria Urquides uh, and Senator Carlos Truan who pioneered bilingual education legislation and school change agents like Dr. Henry Ramirez from California and Dr. Jose Cárdenas need to be recognized for the significant roles they played in fighting discrimination in education and in fighting for equity, pluralism, and inclusion in the schools. They were very much an integral part of the Chicano movement and should be celebrated for their courage, creativity, and determination to improve schools and how they educated Mexican Americans during these years of radicalism. Finally, next slide. I saw an opportunity to make sense of the new scholarship that had appeared on the radical Chicano movement in the last several decades, and to provide a concise interpretation of this period based on all of these new works. Countless of books have been published on El Movimiento Chicano since the 1990s. They have covered many topics from church takeovers to Chicano feminism to reinterpretations of prominent leaders like Reyes Lopez Tijerina and Cesar Chavez, uh, studies on the many different types of struggles initiated during these years have also been published. Which books should one not familiar with this history read in order to become familiar with its emergence in the late 1960s and 1970s? When did the movement originate? What ideologies undergirded it? what types of struggles were initiated, and with what results. This becomes especially crucial at the undergraduate level for students who are just learning about the Chicano movement. And it's difficult for a professor to assign books on the Chicano movement that will cover various aspects, because there's not that much time to cover in a Chicano history book unless you're focusing specifically on the Chicano movement era. So I thought that this would be uh, an opportunity to develop at least one interpretation that took account of all of the, these different studies that have focused on all of these various aspects of the Chicano movement and have it in one short, succinct chapter um, for people to read. Now I would like now to talk about the organization of the book and the chapters that lay out my argument. Uh, next slide, please. First, um, hopefully it's not, um, okay, let me proceed. First I want to, um, I'll provide a brief overview of the origins of the uh, Mexican American Civil Rights Movement in the first half of the 20th century and the role that political moderates played in fighting for civil rights and equal um, opportunity during these decades. I emphasize the importance of organizations and uh, such as LULAC and the American GI Forum in leading these efforts. Although moderates dominated the civil rights movement for over 30 years, radical labor and social activists played important roles in it as well. The radical wing of the Mexican-American civil rights movement um, however, were suppressed 
and decimated during the Cold War era of the 1950s. After providing some brief background information on the origins of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement in the 20th century, uh, I turn to uh, my attention to the 1960s. In the first chapter, let me see, this is moderates and moderates. the next uh, I turn my attention to the 1960s. In the first chapter, I described the expansion of civil rights activities to the national level uh, during the early and mid 1960s. Moderates through the Viva Kennedy clubs and other means expanded their activities to the national level and began to pressure the president, Congress, and the courts for recognition as an identifiable minority group for assistance in obtaining their civil rights and for additional resources to deal with the problems confronting their communities. Fears and determined struggles by moderate organizations such as LULAC, the American GI Forum, MAPA, and others eventually led to their recognition as a minority group requiring federal assistance and to their acceptance as political actors in the national arena. Recognition and acceptance was given in 1967 and 1968. During these years, President Johnson appointed key individuals to his cabinet, developed Mexican-American offices in the federal bureaucracy, and channeled funds to local communities throughout the country. In the second half of the chapter, I focus on the appointment of LBJ, um, by LBJ of Vicente Jimenez, a former president of the American GI Forum to head a new federal office, the Interagency Committee on Mexican-American Affairs. This committee had two purposes, advise the president on Mexican-American issues and provide, provide federal assistance to address poverty and discrimination in the Spanish-speaking communities throughout the Southwest. I then look at the, co um, the committee's impact on moderate leaders, <coughs> on radicals in the barrio, and on civil rights and educational equality. I also document some of the accomplishments of uh, this committee during these years. As Mexican-American moderates uh, finally were getting recognized by the federal government, next slide, and receiving additional resources to deal with their own problems, a new generation of radical voices was emerging in the Southwest. Uh, those were the recognition. No, uh, the next slide, please. I'm not in charge of my slides. It makes it difficult to sort of <laughs> align the slides with the top. Uh, but a new generation of radical voices was emerging. Chapter 2 of my book discusses these individuals, how they differed from the moderates, uh, and the actions they took inspiring thousands of young people to join in causes and then to form the Chicano movement. Most historians acknowledge these radical voices, but they only focus on a few male leaders and the organizations they headed. Among these are Cesar Chavez, and Dolores Huerta with the um, United Farm Workers, Reyes Lopez Tijerina and the Land Grant Movement, and Corky Gonzalez and the Crusade for Justice. And most of them also acknowledge the role that both college and high school student um, age youngsters played uh, in this early period, uh, you, especially with uh, the mention of the walkouts uh, that started really in San Antonio uh, in, um, and in the Valley and, and then in Los Angeles and then spread throughout uh, other cities. A few studies mention Jose Angel Gutierrez as one of the major radicals during these years. I do not. In my view, Jose Angel Gutierrez was not a major leader of the Chicano community during the mid-1960s, similar to Chavez, Tijerina, or even Corky. Although he played important roles during these years, he did not become a national leader until the Chicano movement emerged. In addition to the importance of these radical leaders and their organizations, I also include Francisca Flores and the League of Mexican-American Women as playing a key role in laying the foundation for the emergence 
of both feminism and the Chicano movement during the early and mid-1960s. These activists differed from moderate ones at the national level in several different ways. First, they did not seek the assistance or the recognition of the federal government. They sought community empowerment and independent political action. Second, they rejected the community's traditional dependence on conventional methods of change, such as lobbying, advocacy, negotiation, and litigation. Instead of conventionality, the new generation of radicals embraced militancy, civil disobedience, mass mobilization, marches, demonstrations, and boycotts as legitimate means of struggle. They, in other words, rejected the politics of the moderate liberal agenda and the embraced politics of protest. Third, they questioned the culture of the liberal agenda, the idea that Americans needed to assimilate and to forget their own culture in order to succeed. For these activists, the Spanish language, Mexican culture, and ethnic pride were important ingredients of their emerging identity and needed to be utilized, preserved, and affirmed. All of them thus incorporated elements of this heritage into the struggle for social justice. Fourth, they embraced the notion of independent actions and sought to organize either independent of existing Anglo leaders and parties or of Mexican-American men. Finally, they expanded the traditional concerns of the Chicano um, civil rights movement, uh, of the civil rights movement of rights, recognition, and resources, and added new ones, such as land dispossession, economic justice, cultural identity, and feminism. The new radical voices of the 1960s introduced some of the key ideas and practices that would later be incorporated into the Chicago movement. Despite the presence of radical voices, um, next slide, there was still no Chicano movement by 1968 due to the absence of a Chicano identity. Multiple state or local collective identities existed during the early and mid 1960s. The UFW promoted a union identity. Tijerina and Indo Hispano identity. Flores, a feminist identity. Corky, a nationalist identity. And Chicano students, a Mexican American or Chicano identity. This changed in 1969. In this year, uh, Corky Gonzalez, um, that's a misplaced slide, so uh, the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, in this year, Corky Gonzalez called for the mobilization and unification of young militant activists throughout the country. The youth conference served to unite activists throughout the country around a particular ideology, nationalism. The acceptance of nationalism, as well as militancy and the politics of protest, led to the creation of the Chicano movement in 1969. The idea of nationalism, however, was not a clearly defined ideology, nor was it a monolithic idea. It was contested over time by various groups and, um, and individuals uh, many of whom were influenced by a variety of other ideologies, such as feminism, Marxism, anti-colonial thought, and liberalism. The influence of these other ideologies eventually led to the development of many nationalisms in the radical Chicano movement. I briefly note, uh, but don't elaborate on, uh, in this chapter that the existence of different nationalisms complicated Chicano movement struggles and in many cases led to further conflict and tension within and between groups. 
Activists involved in radical challenges to the status quo and guided by complex notions of multiple nationalisms. Let's see, um, do the next slide. And guided by complex notions of multiple nationalisms, initiated numerous political struggles centered around certain um, dimensions that included race, class, gender, and culture. The historian Ignacio M. Garcia noted in his book, Chicanismo, that during the late 1960s and 1970s, Chicano activists, intellectuals, and artists rediscovered pride in their community, racial origins, and working class status. Emphasis of the latter quickly led activists to support a law, large number of struggles waged by workers. One major focus of radical activists thus was on class or on struggles dealing with working class individuals, communities, and conditions. These activists, for instance, supported the unionization effort of the United Farm Workers, the 1972 Farrah strike by Chicanos, Chicanas in El Paso, campaigns against unfair wages and working conditions by university workers in Arizona, and the battles by undocumented workers for human rights. A second major focus of the Chicano movement struggles was race. Activists formed or joined a vast number of organizations and fought against personal and institutional forms of racism in foreign policy, law enforcement, the electoral system, and public education. They, for instance, opposed U.S. involvement in Vietnam and mounted a vigorous movement against an unjust and racist war. Other activists subjected the two-party system, uh, rejected the two-party system, and established La Raza Unida Party. Others still contested assimilationist ideology and fought for Mexican-American history in the public schools. Internal differences and institutional repression, um, especially government surveillance or state repression, however, undermined many of these struggles. Another major focus of the Chicano movement was the development of a feminist praxis. Struggles, struggles that confronted patriarchy as a system of oppression and gender discrimination. They engaged in a variety of issues and participated in both male-based and female only organizations. Most importantly, they expanded the historic struggle against racism to include gender. In concerns that, um, they also uh, included concerns that they faced as women. Issues such as uh, forced sterilization, prison welfare reform, increased visibility in religious and social organizations, cultural awareness, reproductive rights, and education, many issues that the Chicano males did not focus on as much. A final focus of the Chicano movement pertained to culture and struggles aimed at contesting the suppression of Mexican language and culture and at discovering, recovering, or affirming distinct cultural forms in the Mexican origin community. The next, next slide. Radicals, however, were not the only ones involved in the Chicano movement. So were moderates. Mexican-American moderates, in other words, did not disappear. They continued and expanded their activism during these years. Much of this activism was due to the continuing work of those involved in organizations such as LULAC, the American GI Forum, MAPA, PASO. Additionally, a new generation of moderate leaders emerged out of the Chicano movement and formed organizations like MALDEF, the East Los Angeles Community Union, uh, the Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project, um, Padres, Las Hermanas, and many more to expand the efforts of earlier activists. Mexican uh, moderate Mexican-American activists were as much a part of the Chicano movement as were the radicals. I remember one specific incident, uh, I might um, discuss here uh, another uh, issue, was uh, 
when I approached uh, for an interview, uh, one of the uh, individuals uh, who was involved in drafting the uh, Civil Rights Commission reports that were issued by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. There were, I think, six reports. Uh, and she was responsible for, for writing uh, the one on Texas dealing with unequal funding of the schools. Um, I had met her during that period. I didn't know what she was doing, but I had met her in New York City when I was an undergraduate. Uh, we had a, a committee uh, to pick it on behalf of the farm workers in New York City. Uh, and she was visiting her boyfriend, who was a, uh, a student also at Columbia uh, University. And um, she would see me doing all these radical activities. Uh, and she would support me in that effort. Uh, and so when I called her to interview her to find out more about what she was doing during the Chicano movement, and I had asked her as part of the, the questions, you know, like, how did you feel uh, um, you working inside the system? Because she was working on behalf of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, while we were doing all this political work with the, the Chicano movement, and she, she looked at me and says, look, what's, what's the matter with you? You're crazy. Because I was as much a part of the civil rights movement as you were. But I was working within the system. You were working outside of the system. And again, there she brought clarity to the issues that you can't separate struggles. They're all part of the same struggles. And what we've done is sort of separated those struggles and not included those individuals and the important work that they've done. But moderates, let me go back to uh, talk, moderates uh, motivated by liberalism and different degrees of nationalism work with established political leaders and institutions to fight for social justice and equality. A few of these leaders opposed the radicals in their midst. And we know some of them, for example, uh, David Montejano has written about the role that Henry B. played uh, in um, attacking uh, Mayo here in Houston. But while a few of these leaders opposed the radicals uh, in the midst, most actively supported them. Moderates engaged in a variety of struggles aimed at eliminating prejudice and all forms of discrimination in education, employment, law enforcement, uh, the electoral arena, and uh, urban neighborhoods. As in the past, moderates tackled a variety of issues and utilized different strategies to achieve this goal. Uh, next slide. Analytically, I look at two major types of moderates. Those involved in the electoral arena and those fighting for educational, uh, in, um, those involved in the social arena and those involved in the um, educational arena. Uh, the former, that is the social moderates, tackled several issues during the Chicano movement and engaged in multiple struggles for civil rights and social justice over the years. For instance, Willie Velasquez, the Southwest Voter Education Registration Project, and MALDEF fought against discrimination in the electoral arena and initiated efforts to increase community empowerment by promoting voter education and participation in local, state, and national elections. Well-established organizations like the American GI Forum and LULAC, and new ones like MALDEF and IMAGE at the national level, mounted campaigns against demeaning media stereotypes of Mexican Americans and racist individuals in mainstream work, uh, institutions. They also continue to advance the struggle for representation and to seek presidential appointments of Mexican Americans to important positions in the executive and judicial branch of government. As in prior decades, moderate activists and organizations spoke out against racist comments by political leaders or stereotypical portrayals of Mexican Americans by mainstream media, pressured Catholic and Protestant churches to be more sensitive to Mexican American needs, contested exclusionary practices in private businesses and in government agencies, and, for, and opposed forced assimil, uh, sterilization of women, police brutality, and harsh immigration policies. Unlike radicals, moderate leaders and organizations saw changes without resorting to confrontation or demonstrations. New and old organizations engaged in local efforts to revitalize and improve their communities. 
Some organizations engaged in community development effort. These included not only LULAC and the American GI Forum, but also new ones that emerged out of the Chicano movement, including Telacu, Chicanos por la Causa, Mexican American Unity Council, and a few others. These organizations developed affordable housing, established community-based businesses, provided social and educational services, and promoted cultural activities. Others formed new faith-based or secular organizations and applied pressure on local officials to improve community conditions and to provide adequate city services. These actions eventually led to an increase in their own political power. In chapter five next, I focus on those who advanced the historic struggle for, um, for uh, educational equality during the Chicano movement years. School activists fought discrimination in education and fought for culturally relevant programs. I began by summarizing the literature on litigation struggles. Some activists, especially parents, for example, had faith in the courts and continued to file lawsuits against school segregation in the late 1960s and 1970s. Unlike earlier activists, they also expanded their challenge to other forms of discrimination in the schools, such as school testing, unequal education, exclusion of undocumented students, and lack of ethnic studies in the elementary and secondary grades. Other activists, especially educators, devoted their lives to promoting a variety of significant changes in education. Some, like Dr. Jose A. Cárdenas and Pam B. Cárdenas, for, for instance, helped shape federal anti-discrimination policies, especially the May 25th Memorandum issued by the Office for Civil Rights in 1970 and later the Law Remedies in 1974. Others still advocated for culturally relevant programs aimed at improving the instruction provided for English language learners. These individuals worked within policy-making entities to enact and implement federal and state bilingual education programs for Mexican Americans and other language minority students. They believed in the system and did not engage in the politics of protest. Finally, a few courageous, courageous educators became active agents of change within schools and created innovative school programs aimed at increasing the academic achievement of poor, under, uh, privileged students. Uh, Maria Urquides, Dr. Henry Ramirez, Dr. Armando Rodriguez, um, and Superintendent Jose Cárdenas are several of, of these individuals and they are uh, given brief profiles in the book. My book then is about the moderates during the Chicano movement. While it emphasizes the role in the struggles of the 1960s and 1970s, my study also seeks to broaden the discourse of this movement. The Chicano movement, in other words, was not only comprised of those who rejected the system and utilized protest methods to achieve their goals. It also included moderates. Both of these wings, the radical and the moderate, need to be considered in any discussion of the Chicano movement and how they ushered in the largest mobilization of Chicanos and Chicanos to fight for the rights that they justly deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We would like to open things up to questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions, so um, I'm calling right now. Go ahead. Somebody again, thank you for, for your for your lecture and, and uh, for providing right a new sort of lens in which to explore the Chicano movement, if you will. I'm wondering, I was really interested when when you were on the phone call with the person who said, hey, what, what's wrong with you? We're working the same struggle. You're from within, I'm from within, I'm from within, you're from without. I'm wondering, did that, did you look for other examples where maybe that was the case? Like, for example, I'm wondering more specifically, were you able to find instances in where uh, moderates and non-moderates formed coalitions uh, in the struggle, if you found any of those? Yeah, um, I found some, but um, I had to cut the book out, uh, oh. and I eliminated many of these, and 
hopefully I can follow up or somebody else can follow up with some of these. But uh, I, I did find, for instance, right after uh, I finished the book, I, there was one other book that provided what I thought was a model of, of the interaction between the moderates and the radicals. And it's a book, I think it's called uh, The Dawn of Diversity, uh, dealing with the, uh, the presence of Chicanos at Stanford University. And that's the first book where I find where, for example, uh, it discusses Luis Nogales, who was working with the president to try to improve uh, uh, the hiring of Chicano faculty and the recruitment of Chicano students, while the um, undergraduate students, and I guess it would be the Mecha students, uh, were protesting and demonstrating. And he has a lot of data, not data, but documents showing the relationship then between the radical students when they engage in some action, then they would go talk to the least Nogata, Nogata said it was uh, leading this effort, uh, to make sure that it wouldn't disrupt the efforts he had with the president to ensure that recruitment and monies would be going for recruitment and other kinds of efforts. And that's the first case where I see that interaction between those working within the system for changes within the system uh, and those working outside of the system, and then they work together to make sure that uh, they are able to uh, become more effective in achieving their goals. Now, that's the, the first book that I looked at, but I, I'm been keeping up with some of the other books. As you know, there's many books that are starting to come out now, and it's hard to keep up with the literature. Um, but there is another book that uh, hints at this, and it's uh, the, the book by uh, Felipe, in Hosa, in Hosa, yes, uh, uh, Ages um, of Change, I believe it's called. And uh, he uh, alludes to that. Uh, he focuses on those that were demonstrating um, against the church uh, and um, suggests that there were people inside that were facilitating, uh, that was facilitating those struggles. Uh, but he doesn't uh, elaborate or discuss those kinds of interactions. He just alludes to that, that there were those on the inside of the church that played instrumental roles. Uh, but I think we just need to have that kind of uh, a better understanding that, yes, it is not the radicals only or, or the moderates only, but um, it is uh, somehow uh, an, an interaction. But we don't know what that interaction was because people are not focusing on trying to uncover the, the interaction. No, no, thank you for that. And uh, I'm wondering, um, in that first book that you referenced, um, the dawn of, I'm sorry, what was it? It's called the dawn of the diversity. Okay. Uh, do you know if that if that coalition was formal or informal between students and uh, the gentleman who was working? It, it was informal. Informal. Uh, informal because they knew each other. Uh, uh, they were they were all at one institution. Yeah. Uh, and the, the students just didn't believe that the administration was being honest in its negotiations, and so you know they protested. But um, it, there was no formal uh, mechanism for that. They just knew each other, and they wanted to make sure that uh, their their goals were accomplished. Thank you, uh, Lupe. You know, is uh, the the whole notion of, of moderate and, and legal is a pretty spongy they're pretty spongy labels you know and then if you just think of ourselves i mean i think you and i follow similar trajectories uh when i was in san antonio in uh, my own i was called the communist you know and then later i'm in the san francisco Bay area and i'm a moderate democrat i'm a reformist and i, I did I mean, what changed was geography. That's what changed, you know? And I'm thinking also another thing that changes is time. In other words, Hector P. Garcia and Henry B. were radicals in their, in their youth in there. And then later, we're the ones that ended up calling them bandidos, you know? Because, you know, they, uh, circumstances have changed, right? Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering how you, if you acknowledge that or, or talk about how these these conceptions or labels really vary by time and, and geography, really, you know. 
Yeah, I, I don't dwell as much on it. I What I want to do, I threw out a, a definition and then I started working within that definition. But um, if, as you say, in, in some cases, the, the moderates that we're talking about are doing some uh, very radical things. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I tend to focus more on the, the tactics that they're utilizing. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it didn't matter how radical Dr. Hector P. Garcia was, and he was quite radical. Uh, he was not, for example, um, he would um, <coughs> confront, you know, uh, a the labor secretary or uh, the director of OCR or whatever and tell them to their face, you know, that, you know, that they were discriminating against Mexican Americans. You know. uh, so he uh, was quite critical in that sense. But Dr. Hector B. Garcia had a faith in the system. He never gave up on that faith. Uh, a lot of the, the Mayos that, that I knew in Corpus, for example, had given up on the system. Uh, and very similar, we looked at what Jorge Gonzalez was writing, for instance. Jorge Gonzalez was writing not like Jose Angel about the two-party system. You know, Jose Angel was being pragmatic. He you know, uh, says, how can we make the two-party system more effective for Chicanos? Whereas Jorge was essentially saying the two-party system, it, it's inherently corrupt and racist. We can't work with the two-party system. You see, and that's where uh, um, you have a moderate, he might be considered a radical because of how he approached uh, change or what he said, but um, Jose Angel had a faith in the system. Uh, I don't think my understanding of Corky is he didn't have that same faith in that system. Cesar Chavez had a faith in the system that uh, at some point in time, you know, the powerful people would make the right choices and provide uh, wage increases to uh, farm workers and allow them, you know, to make decisions on their own. So, yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's a very difficult concept to deal with. Uh, but I tend to focus more in terms of what about those that do you believe in the system or do you not believe in the system? Do you believe in these ideas that are embedded in the system? Uh, um, or do you uh, seek to displace those? Uh, I mean, if we talk about uh, the Revolutionary League and all of these Marxist nationalists, uh, they didn't believe in capitalism. You know, they, they, at least their decisions were that they wanted to eliminate capitalism, overthrow it, and establish a social society. Uh, I don't know of any of my radical friends that really spoke at that level where they said capitalism is a problem, although there were some that said that. But um, the vast majority of those that were actively involved uh, had some faith in the system. They might not have had faith in LBJ, uh, but they had faith uh, that the system um, that this was a good system and that at some point in time that Chicanos would achieve social justice. So the Russell Nia party is a moderate response. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. Because it's a pragmatic it's a pragmatic okay. approach to increase uh, Mexican American representation in the electoral arena. Okay. Whereas I, I don't think Corky was interested in winning elections to become part of the Democratic Party. Okay. So so it might be that the, the paradigm that you have of radicals versus uh, conservatives or moderates, okay, might be seen in another way, which I'm hearing you say it, but it hasn't really been said, it, and that is those of us who worked within the system and those of us who chose to work outside the system. Because even those who you have mentioned that were within the system, when they were in that system, they were, they were looked at as radicals within that system in the school districts. And so rather than the, the, the liberal versus that, really, you know, how do you impact change? And how do you achieve change? And those of us who chose to achieve change from the inside really made a, a huge difference in, in, in the laws of Texas with education, the laws in bilingual education, um, avance, 
all of that. And then those who chose to impact outside of the system, in my estimation, almost had it easier because they could be crazy and they could do really nasty stuff. And that was okay because they were outside the system. But it, it might be interesting for you to look at the change agents within the system and what a, di what a difference those made um, that may not have been recognized, yeah. like Al Kaufman or Maldiff and the work that he did uh, to bring bilingual education uh, to the things like Gloria from Avance. Um, I myself was president of Pache, which is the Texas Association of Chicago's Educa Educators, and they would say that I was in Guanita because I'm Cuban, and I was in Tache, president, uh, and Tatian Tabe, which was the Texas Association of Bilingual Education. So, and my husband, who worked for Willie Velasquez. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think you're, you're right, and, and that's why I, when I did the book, and um, I wanted to begin a discussion on how do we approach this topic that hasn't been approached before, mm -hmm. because we just dismiss certain people uh, for various reasons. Uh, and I think we need to be much more um, serious and systematic in addressing these concerns so that we can see, if we can find case studies, for example, of those maybe that were successful, those that were not, what happened, but not the idea as well because there were radicals and uh, people were disappointed in what they were doing. And, uh, but the idea here is that uh, how do you work within the system and how do you work outside the system and what do you, how do you label these individuals? Because they themselves have certain labels mm -hmm. uh, and they have certain kinds of ideas. Uh, and those on the inside might not engage in protests. I, I don't know, for example, at any point in time if Dr. Uh, 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 Jose Cardenas ever went to a protest and demonstration, you know. But his ideas were very radical in that yes. he was seeking how, you, how the schools change educating young children who spoke a language other than English. And those were threatening ideas to those in the system. But they were not out there picketing and demonstrating, but if Jose Angel was picketing and demonstrating on, right. on behalf of that, they would support yes. Jose Angel. Yes. Uh, so in, in this sense that we don't know, for example, how uh, um, Dr. Garden has worked with Jose Angel. I was surprised for this when, when I, I looked at the archives of the Southwest Council de la Raza, you know, and I had found some photos there uh, of the initial meetings. Uh, and uh, there is Jose Angel Gutierrez sitting next to Dr. Cardenas. You know? And for me, again, Jose Angel was a radical. Says, what is he doing in this organization? Uh, and, and again, you know, I was thinking, um, I've, I've only thought of, of radical history. Uh, but by defining radical in a certain way, I was missing out on the, the way in which people, especially those within the system, and I have faith in the system, how they were working to uh, achieve the same kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, I think we need to look at this differently if we can have a national a, a discussion to uh, decide, not decide, but to uh, see how we can approach this differently to include those that have not been included in uh, the struggle for civil rights. I hope I answered the question. My name is Gloria Rodriguez. I'm the founder of Avance and just celebrated 50 years providing educational services for parents of young children under the age of three. Phenomenal organization. And I am uh, writing uh, my own book, and I think I really like what you said on having those case studies to really see how these uh, change agents, you know, what they did to create the needed change. And I consider myself working outside, uh, within the system, because, but at the same time, outside of the system. And yet, uh, I'll just give you one example of when we we're trying to change the schools because they really ignored children who didn't come to school prepared. 
They just set them aside, labeled them, and ignored them. And uh, and I said, well, wait a minute. As a first grade teacher, we've got to start earlier. We've got to start with the parents, provide the support that they need. And it was so new, that concept. Nobody wanted to listen. So I had to go outside of the educational system within the city to get the first funding to prove that we could make a difference in getting those children prepared and successful in life. So within that system, the parents, we organized the parents to go up to City Hall to protest, to make sure we get our money to provide these services. And within the system was Maria Antonieta Vier Salado and some staff members who supported me. So it, it, it's not one or the other, it's just a combination of, of leaders wanting change and figuring out creatively how to make it happen and, and then proving, see, we, sh we showed you that these strategies were needed. And Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, Jose Carmen was on my board. Gloria Zamora was the chairman of my board. Bambi was also on my board. So many of us got together. But I know when I was at Our Lady of the Lake with Maria Antonieta and Rosie Castro, some of us went different directions. <coughs> Rosie would say, come on, let's go boycott in Crystal City. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready to do that. I want to get my degree make sure I succeed, and, uh, and then create the changes from within. Uh, but we all needed each other. We've all been in this kind of click uh, support system, uh, but the common cause was change. And the supporters of, of that time was the Johnson administration, because many of us were given an opportunity to go to college from these communities, and we were from the outside looking in, and now say, oh my God, this is not right, this is not fair. We've got to go back to our communities and change them. Yes. So I really like your, your statement of uh, needing a follow-up on these case studies of all of these leaders that did create changes, and what happened within that. It's not in your own. Yes, and, and thank you for that. Uh, and I agree that there's some groups that you know, uh, we need to study much more carefully. I mean, yours is, is one of them, the Indra is another one. Uh, the National Blue Light Educational Service also has 50 years of celebration. Uh, there's some groups that have managed to survive and thrive uh, and promote the significant changes um, during uh, this um, changing political climate that we've seen over the past 30 years. Uh, now what happens um, to these uh, organizations and individuals, we don't know, but the thing is that we don't have studies that focus on the role that those on the inside, what I call the moderates. We don't know what roles they have been playing because we keep emphasizing the radicals. And uh, one of the slides that I had there was a, a list of books. Uh, I think there were about 15 books that I, that I listed there. I, I don't know if you can uh, pull that slide up. But that's just an example. That's uh, all the books were on the Chicano movement. But none of these moderates are uh, uh, the subject of the, of the studies. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of marketing. You know, I'm a founding board member. And we call them transformational leaders. You know, it, they transform things. And we've got to acknowledge and recognize how did they do it, why did they do it, do it, and learn from it. I, I have a question for you. It's sure. just from uh, sort of a, a, the way that we teach the public about civil rights history. I think it's a very common framing for the African American civil rights movement history to talk about the moderates, MLK and, and SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and juxtapose them to the radicals, Mark, uh, Malcolm X and, and the Black Panthers. That is so common when we talk about the African American civil rights movement, whether you agree with that framing or not. But why have we not discussed this framing in, in the Mexican American civil rights movement? I, I have no idea. I, I mean, um, my, my understanding of that, that concept, that idea, 
was based on personal experience because I was involved with some of these radical activities. I was involved with also radical activities in New York City, uh, like taking over buildings and that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do that. <laughs> uh, but, but at the same time, you know, I, because I was in the School of Education and um, I started writing on bilingual education, I came across bilingual leaders. And I would go to these conferences and take students, uh, undergraduate students, to these conferences. Uh, and then I would go to some of the events that they, they were doing, at the Avila uh, and many others, and I would see them um, being confronted by um, conservative members of the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, they were trying to dismantle and destroy bilingual ed. Yeah. Uh, by you know doing things that most people wouldn't understand, like redefining bilingual as it didn't include uh, the native language of the child, which is English only instruction, and they would be in these forums, and then they would challenge these uh, 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 bureaucrats uh, who were trying to destroy bilingual ed. They would challenge them in these forums, you know, and I was just so impressed in that. You know, this is what us as radicals, I was thinking, this is what we should be doing. Is that, but they're doing it, but they're doing it with the skills that they've acquired. They know uh, the language, they know the theories, they know the statistics, you know, and they're utilizing these uh, new forms of knowledge and skills to challenge these ideas that are being promoted. Uh, and so I was gaining more understanding of the importance of these individuals on the inside. Uh, and that's why it took me uh, quite a while. And originally, Bambi uh, Cardenas was the one that suggested this because we, uh, we were at a, at a session years ago, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And um, one of our members was doing um, um, a paper on um, Tom Carter, who was well known within uh, educational circles. Uh, and uh, she said, well, there's a lot of Chicanos that you need to study. Well, Tom Carter was a great man, great studies, uh, and he provided useful information for the activists, but it was the Chicanos who were really involved up from the inside. She says, you should look at those. And then she gave me a list of all of these people. Here are people, uh, whether you want psychologists, sociologists, you know, uh, whether you want administrators, uh, whether you want people from the Office for Civil Rights, it's just all of these people have been involved and nobody writes about them. You know, and that's when I said, well, let me see if I can at least focus on the educational activists. And then I started broadening it a little bit more, but uh, uh, the idea was how do, how do you begin to frame it so that you can initiate discussion on this. And it's not simply just, well, it's Lucas Slater's book, and, he has some interesting stuff, or he has stuff that others have covered already. Is it, well, I might have stuff that others have covered. What I want people to get from this book is that we need to look at our history differently. We need to include, be more inclusive of those that have participated in promoting civil rights and educational equality, and um, acknowledge that they play a key roles so that uh, our community is better informed of the variety of struggles uh, and the variety of individuals that have been involved in those struggles. Um, just one, one last thing, if I could, just because we do have a San Antonio audience here. Uh, Henry B. Gonzalez. There's this notorious incident here where Henry B. Uh, is at a restaurant and uh, somebody accuses him of, of being a communist. And Henry B. takes great offense because he's, you know, sees himself as Patriot, right? Patriotic American, and um, and there's a whole incident. <laughs> Punched him in the face, uh, and um, and Henry B is someone who I will tell you. A couple of years ago, we were working on an exhibit here at Macri on um, uh, Mexican American Civil Rights Trailblazers from San Antonio, and, and I put Henry in the in the exhibit, and I actually uh, made him one of the uh, images in the kind of cover image for this virtual exhibit, and I got some criticism about Henry B, you know, he, he was against the Chicano movement. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the complicated, the complications of Henry B, or the, the multifaceted uh, personality of Henry B? Well, um, 
I haven't studied Henry B. In fact, uh, I've depended on others who have studied him, but uh, I, I think he's, he's one of those individuals that is a perfect example of how the political climate has changed around his ideas. Uh, and uh, so he still, he still had the same kinds of ideas. He was still against all forms of, of discrimination. Uh, and when the political climate becomes more liberal and uh, more accepting of radical ideas, then he becomes a conservative uh, in that sense within the Chicano community. Uh, and it's difficult, especially for, I guess, people from San Antonio. Uh, I, I don't think the people from Houston uh, are as offended in, in having somebody like, you know, Henry B. Uh, be in a panel or discussion or uh, portrait of, of civil rights activists. But because he had such an impact at a very particular point in time, and it was such a negative impact, uh, you know, people have different ideas of how they should view their uh, And And um, I, I just don't know how that can be resolved because uh, it's it's still real. I mean, um, it's raw still in many people. Uh, it had specific impacts on specific organizations and specific individuals. Uh, and it's hard, you know, to, to, to put that aside. Uh, I'm not even sure if some of these individuals can still work with the Henry B. family yeah. uh, uh, on many of these issues, but uh, it's, it's, it's complicated and it becomes more complicated as the political climate changes. Uh, and with respect to the Chicano community, with respect to the Chicano movement, it changed at a particular point in time when he then became the, the conservative in the community trying to stop the changes from taking place that many wanted. I mean, you had your, your yeah, I was, was going to say, if you read what Henry B. his uh, speeches right before the Chicano movement, they're almost, I mean, you could have a Chicano movement person saying the same things. I mean, there was very little, very little distance between what Henry B. believed in and what the Chicano movement was trying to aspire. But he got it all freaked out by uh, the riots in the northern cities, and he thought that uh, we young youngsters were gonna do the same here in San Antonio. You yeah. know, he was really concerned yeah. about that. Then once, uh, and then he had a sensitive skin, you know, he had a very thin skin. And uh, so once uh, the Chicano movement leaders at that time, I guess, you know, Jose and others, start insulting him, that was it. It was over. There was just a training of insults after that. Yeah. And then Henry V just sort of labeled all the Chicano movement organizations as part of the same kind of ball of wax. So, it, 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 he got, he took it very personally. Yeah. He took it very personally. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. But I just want to add a little bit. Uh, so at Maldef, uh, Henry B. was one of the major reasons that Maldef moved from San Antonio to San Francisco uh, because he was so concerned that Maldef was working with Luciano Gutierrez and he was doing too much toward, toward Rosa Nita and not toward the Democrats. And that caused him a lot of stink. Uh, but back, going back also, the other side of Henry B. is, as David said, uh, in 1960, he was the leader of an effort to stop segregation legislation passing the, the Texas uh, legislature. He was the leader and uh, led led a, a gigantic uh, fight against that legislation to stop it. Uh, it was very well known for that. People called him a crazy Mexican radical. So I guess people have different sides for sure. He also opposed the, the Voting Rights Act uh, passage because uh, the people of Maldives and others said that voting rights might be one way to stop all the annexations on the, on the north side, which were diluting the voting rights of Latinos in the city, and uh, he's, he was all he, he wanted those annexations to protect the water. So it's it's a complicated room. I guess we all know that. I'm just saying, to Tim in particular, uh, very interesting for sure. I have a question. Um, in light of looking at what you uh, viewed over the last 50 years, more or less, how would you describe the arc of you know growing? or lack of growing power of 
Mexican Americans today? And have we plateaued or have we regressed? Or are we still growing? I think that we're still growing. Uh, and I think we're going to keep growing. Uh, but the, the notion of Latino power, again, I'm not a political scientist. I don't deal with the contemporary periods. I'm a historian. But I, I think that what, what the trends that I see is that we do see a growth in the Latino um, uh, office holding uh, individuals. Now, because it's such a conservative period, uh, what we're seeing is the growth of a conservative Latino office holder. And not necessarily at Ted Cruz, you know, but you do have conservatives in South Texas that are now, you know, switching to the Republican Party uh, that are from the community, that are from the barrio, have worked on many issues in the community. Uh, and for various political reasons, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're supporting the Republican Party and becoming more Republican. Now, it might have to do with the advances in our community. For example, there are much, many more uh, business members individuals that own businesses. And many of the business class tends to support the Republican Party, and they seek uh, advantages to um, increase their businesses. Say, so it might have something to do with the socioeconomic changes in the community. But in, in essence, I do think that we're gonna be seeing an increase in Latino power over time, but it will probably become more diverse and more conservative. But, but if you see them in the businesses, they're older. You know, the changes that came about when I was young came really originated in the universities. We were really motivated and stimulated and given opportunities. And so we wanted to create change. How do you see the dynamics with the, within the universities now versus back then 50 years ago? What do you mean that, uh, in, within the universities? Well, are, are the university students as concerned about issues are wanting change now as, as it was 50 years ago? I don't think that's the case. Uh, but I, I do think that there is a, um, a growing number of students uh, within the universities that seek change. But they, the change that they're seeking is through social media. and. Um, it's not, I think, as effective in many cases as actual organizing on the ground. Uh, and so what happens is that you might have a petition being signed by 10,000, 12,000 people, uh, but that might not change much. Uh, they are still working for change, utilizing social media. Now, I don't see them organizing, making um, inroads in forming new organizations, political organizations, and going into the community and organizing in the community. But again, I am isolated from many of these activists, for example, within the undocumented community, within the immigrant community. There's a great deal of organizing at that level, not necessarily social media. Social media is part of that, but active uh, organizing in the ground, where you have organizations and they're working with others to increase the organizations, and then they're engaging in actions, uh, protests, demonstrations, lobbying, letter writing. They're utilizing a variety of strategies, not simply just protests. And those um, seem to be um, in a variety of states, but I, I'm not sure whether those are growing over time because of the political climate we're in. Uh, and whether those are transitional uh, or whether those are temporary. It's, it's difficult to, to gauge that uh, as a professor from a university not being involved anymore in, in those kinds of activities. I was involved in political organizing in Houston. I was a parent activist for many years. Uh, and we organized a multiracial black, brown, white parent group uh, in HISD uh, to bring about changes. But as you know, I mean, the, the right is so powerful that they've uh, sort of undermined any kind of parent activists. They, they're not listening to parents anymore. They've taken over the, the school board. They've taken over the school district. 
and they're implementing changes without the uh, concerns of the parents. And it's difficult to get any kind of organization of parents to meet uh, against the school district because they're so powerful, they've already done it. And uh, other than protest and demonstrate, I went to, to one of those meetings where you know, the superintendent goes there and, and gets his uh, flunkies you know, to talk about how they're bringing about better change in the schools. And so several uh, uh, people then get up and says, you know, uh, we want our district back and we start yelling and screaming. Uh, and, but that's about, they seem to be powerless in this effort. Uh, this is one of those cases where I myself don't even know what to do. Uh, I talked to some parents and they said, well, you know, nothing can be done. Uh, and there's this hopelessness in, in the community. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I still work with, within my school. Um, I have a daughter who's in 10th grade. I am the parent uh, representative for her class. Uh, I've been with parents, I've talked to them about this issue, that uh, the changes that are being promoted by the right wing extreme agenda uh, in Houston has not come to the better schools, the bandit schools in Houston. And we have a lot of fabulous schools in Houston. My daughter is in a creative writing of a high school performance and visual arts school. Uh, one of the best schools in the country. And um, I talked to the teachers uh, about what should we do to prepare for the coming of the right wing agenda next year because right now it's only focused on 58 schools. But the superintendent has said he wants all the schools as part of that. And so they said, well, we're trying to ignore them, but we're hoping they won't reach us. He says, you know, you know they, they don't want to engage in that possibility because what can they do as teachers? They don't know what it might look like the following year. But when you have individuals coming in, checking on, a bit, on teachers every 30 minutes, you know, somebody's walking in and checking to see if you're doing the curriculum that the district has uh, developed. Uh, you know, they don't, they can't envision that kind of scenario. So all they're doing is sort of saying, well, we need to work with our kids right now. And we still have a good education for that. And it's difficult then to get an understanding of what do you do when the right has already taken over everything. And there, there are no mechanisms. Uh, there's, you, you can't appeal to anybody because our legislators are a minority. Uh, um, the, the Republicans um, have all of these positions uh, at every state level. And uh, it's difficult to do anything. So there's a sense of hopelessness among many parents. Uh, and I'm not sure what, what can be done at this point. And, and I think that hopelessness. It's terrible to say yeah, that. Yeah. Terrible. Because when we were given an opportunity to go to Jordan and the Lake uh, to become teachers, we had all these speakers to come in and they told us, you can change things. They inspired, they were role models. And then, and as we graduated, it was like, uh, what, what am I gonna change? You know, I can do it. There was hope. And so we need better leadership to bring hope to the students because that's the next generation. Yeah, we need to get rid of the Republican leadership at this point. Exactly. Uh, to initiate any kind of change. I think we have one last question. Um, I'm a teacher of Mexican American Studies. So um, in our teats, there's a lot of history in there in regards to uh, characters from San Antonio, uh, the historical characters. Um, the juxtaposition that you talked about, Sarah, that's, that's a very crucial one reason why I'm here, actually. Uh, when I teach Ma's second semester, you get the, um, the four horsemen of the Chicano movement. Uh, and the, your book, you chose uh, 1968, 1978. When you think about the Mount Rushmore of the Chicano movement, who would you put in there to kind of be the leaders of the modern viewpoint um, to kind of create that juxtaposition within my lectures or within the information? Um, I know you guys are talking about activism, and that, that is the way that we as teachers, we, we do give the information to our kiddos to get them inspired. We want them to be very inspired about the history, and we always get that one radical side. So I, I would like for my, my moderate students to be inspired, 
what leaders can we look to in terms of the other side of the coin? That you talk about the, the nationalisms behind um, Chavez to the well, What other group can we use to create again that, that Mount Rushmore uh, of the modern groups? Modern yeah. places? Well, I, I try to lay out in, in the chapter again, and uh, I might be um, um, not flexible enough, maybe in my time periods, but. Uh, you know, when, when people talk about it, for, for example, Jose Alga, I'll give an example of Jose Alga, so they talk about one of the four horsemen. And I kept thinking, but wait a minute, uh, Jose Alga did not become a significant force until after 1968. Uh, and so what I lay out are, are I, again, that some of the individuals that most people are familiar with, but I try to explain why they became important. They were laying the groundwork for the ideas that would then be incorporated into the Chicano movement. The, uh, the notion of independent work, the notion of working uh, independent of men. Uh, you couldn't work with men because men are, are machistas and, and they won't acknowledge the role that women do. Uh, and they, work, um, they won't um, be serious about the work that they do. You know, those kinds of ideas were being laid out in the 60s. And uh, what, what I try to do is that it's very similar to what others have, have written about, but I include the Chicanas in, in that effort. Chicanas have not been included. Uh, they were not as well known as Cesar Chavez, but if you went to California, they had been doing it for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And they uh, um, motivated women, uh, hundreds of women to be involved and to uh, accept the idea that they needed to act independent of men because men wouldn't allow them uh, the, uh, um, the, the right to be um, who they could be in those organizations. Uh, so, you know, the Mexican-American League then becomes one of the instrumental organizations in Francisca Flores becomes one of the key leaders that should be included because of the feminism that she was promoting as early as the late 1950s. Uh, and then during the, the, the Chicano movement, again, there is no um, one leader. We know that uh, Jose Ángel was a, a, a key leader and uh, Corky Gonzalez was a key leader. But the, the idea is that there are multiple organizations uh, with different ideologies, and they all had their own leaders. I mean, if you talk about the undocumented um, um, movement, the, the effort to organize undocumented workers, you know, Jose Angel plays no role in that, nor does Corky. Right. You know, uh, right, it's Bert Corona. And Bert Corona had certain ideas about organizing that he was able to, to work both within the system and outside of the system. Uh, and so for, for me then, it's, it's to look at the um, multiple leaders that emerge and that have different ideas about organizing. Uh, and while some sought the electoral power, you know, there were some leaders around that issue. But there were other issues. There were issues of gender, uh, the forced sterilization of women, you know, uh, you know, all of these issues became uh, critical and there were largely female uh, activists involved in that, promoting those, those issues and making arguments. Uh, so you have to look at different kinds of issues in different kinds of leaders and not depend what historians call, you know, the great man history, where you only focus on a few great men uh, as being influential in, in, in uh, moving history forward. Uh, so hopefully my book will sort of lay out some of those ideas. It doesn't have everything yet, because we still need more work in how that was being, um, how that uh, was manifested itself over time. And we need more studies, for example, of how the different ideologies combine with um, um, personalities, with state repression, with other kinds of factors, how those undermine the movements and create tensions. And some have been writing about the tensions within the movement, uh, Chicanas against Chicanos, you know, the nationalists against the feminists, uh, struggles within the nationalists between Corky and, and Jose Anke. Um, struggles uh, between the Marxists and the nationalists, uh, uh, 
the revolutionary leagues, these Marxist Leninist organizations trying to take over mecha groups, in, particularly in California, and how many struggles there were for decades, you know, in California is still ongoing. Uh, so there were many kinds of struggles, not one kind of struggle, many leaders and many ideologies that were driving these individuals. Uh, and then you have to sort of add the, the personal stuff, the, uh, the hurt uh, that is embedded in many of these struggles and uh, how people are acting um, uh, over time. And so it's much more complicated simply just, you know, the four horsemen. Well, we have one final question, if you don't mind. I just want to make a comment. I, I wanted to commend you because you have articulated an issue that has been hiding in plain sight, and that is the us, that mentality that we've been talking about. That is a modus operandi from the beginning of, of the Mexican people. For instance, uh, Don Miguel Ibarri Costilla, he was a Catholic priest, but he stepped outside the system when he saw that working inside didn't do the job. The same thing with Francisco I. Madera, who started the Mexican Revolution. He was an intellectual, wealthy intellectual, who stepped outside the system because he saw that the system wasn't working. That's our modus operandi, but we didn't recognize it. And so we always saw it as, you know, those people. And, and there was this kind of conflict that has divided the, uh, the fact that we're all working on the same side. We all are supporting each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Guadalupe San Miguel. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yes, okay. I want to just tell you about a couple of upcoming events. You can just hang out here with me, okay? Um, we have, in our audience, we have with us today uh, Dr. Jesse Esparza, uh, from also from Houston. He's going to be coming back next month, November the 10th, which is a Friday. Now it's going to be at the Guadalupe Bookstore, but it's a it's a joint collaboration between Macri and the Guadalupe. So we'll be there at 6 p.m. Friday, November the 10th, to talk about uh, Dr. Esparza's new book, Raza Schools, and, and he's got a copy of it right there. Um, this book is getting rave reviews, so congratulations on that. And, and so we'll see you hope, next month. And yes. then in December, uh, we'll have another Taliada here at the Macri Visitor Center, Sunday, December the 3rd at 2 p.m. That's going to be with Dr. Carlos Blanton. And I believe you referenced some of his work in, in your book. Um, but so this is a, a project of his that's a few years old, but it's very relevant to Macri, so we asked him to come and talk about it. This is a, a book that he wrote a few years ago called George I. Sanchez, The Long Fight for Mexican-American Integration. And so uh, George Sanchez is another one of these moderates um, and somebody who was very involved in some of the legal uh, fights around um, uh, integration. So I think you'll find that very interesting and, and see connections between that and what we've learned about today. So I hope you'll come back and see us again soon. And to everybody who's joining us online, thank you for joining us online. Just one quick little plug for all of our sponsors. Thank you to uh, the City of San Antonio, the Department of Arts and Culture here in San Antonio, Bear County, Wells Fargo, the General Santicos Fund of the San Antonio Area Foundation, AARP Texas, which sponsored today's talk, and of course, individual donors like you, you can become a donor by going to somosmacri.org forward slash donate. Thank you so much. Now, good afternoon.